All right, y'all. I do believe I am live on Facebook. So I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to come on uh, so we can get started. Because I believe in starting right on time. So I'm going to get this going. And uh, yeah, so I just let my, my group know uh, that I was live. Um, <clears throat> so don't miss anything. I'm going to start right on time at 2.30, so I'm going to give people a few minutes to come on. Uh, today's prophetic word is a doozy. Okay, it's a doozy. <laughs> okay, it, you know, so just to remind you, for those of you that are maybe new to the prophetic or maybe new to my channel, what I do before I come on is I ask the Holy Ghost what the prophetic word is for today, and I give myself some time Ask the Lord so I can study it, so I can study out the scriptures, study out what he's showing me, so I can say what the Holy Ghost wants me to say. Why is that import so important? Because you don't know who's listening. You don't know who's in the audience. You don't know where people are. And so the Lord taught me a while ago to trust him for the message because you don't know who's listening, you don't know who's in the audience, and you don't know what they need. The Lord was like, you don't know what people need, but I do. And the Holy Ghost was like, you don't know where people's hearts are, but I do. So trust me for what you say. And that's the long and short of it. If you're going to flow in the prophetic, if you flow at the basic level of prophetic, the entry level of prophetic is something all believers can and are supposed to walk in. You can pray in tongues, you can see in tongues. And then however, God gives you revelations. God might give you dreams. God might give you open visions while you're wide awake. You might hear things in the spirit. You might see things in the spirit. Because remember that the prophetic is not just prognostication. Prognostication is telling the future. That is a subset of the prophetic. Prophetic is to speak by divinely inspired utterance. That means you say what the Holy Ghost tells you to say. That's what that means. That does not necessarily mean it's always telling the future. Prophecy is not always foretelling. Sometimes prophecy is telling forth. That's why you have to study words to understand what they mean. You can walk in a higher level, the gift of prophecy, that's a stronger anointing. That means that you might see more stuff in the spirit, you might hear more stuff in the spirit, you might be one of those people to where every time you have a dream, it comes true, those dreams are accurate. See, that's a prophetic anointing. That's the gift of prophecy, where every time something happens, that word comes to pass. And then there's the office of a prophet, which is a different level. There's, uh, you have your meetings, you have a mantle, you have a mission. There's a lot you have to go through. There's a lot of training, a lot of purging, a lot of burning, a lot of fire. It's different when you walk in the office of a prophet, but every Christian can walk in at least that beginning level. We're supposed to, not just we can, we're supposed to. So if nothing else, God can warn you when, when things are about to go down. Why would you not want that advantage? When God sit up here telling you he wants to let you know what's going on before it happens. Why would you say no to that? That's always confused me. But anyway, 2.30, we're going to jump on in to today's prophetic word because it's something else. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you just thanking you for your kindness, thanking you for your goodness, thanking you that you never change, thanking you that you are beyond searching, that you cannot be understood with the human brain and you cannot be beheld with the human eye. But you didn't ask us to see you and you didn't ask us to understand you. You asked us to believe you. And then you gave us a measure of faith whereby we can develop and believe you. So I thank you for your system. I thank you for an unlimited system for an unlimited God. And, and we want to believe you today, God. We're going to believe you. So I die to myself right now. Forgive me for any sin. Fill me with the Holy Ghost and breathe through me and speak through me. I'm a vessel. I must decrease so you can increase. So let the words be spoken. What you want, Lord, because you're the one that knows the purpose in the people's hearts. You're the one with all the information. And I'm happy and proud and humble just to be a vessel just to be a part of your program because you don't need us for nothing. So I bless your name and I give you glory for this opportunity to flow in your prophetic word. And signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this word and all that believing. In Jesus' name I pray, decree, declare and decree it. We're looking for you to do great things. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, <clears throat> we're gonna jump on in. Today's prophetic word is trickster. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, today's prophetic word is trickster, okay? So you're gonna have to follow us. If you come on the broadcast late, you're gonna have to go back to the top 
and watch this from the beginning so you can understand everything that I'm saying, okay? All right, so we're gonna read the first of uh, several scriptures to for, help, for me to help you understand what this word is about. We're gonna read probably the most familiar one, the most familiar one in the Bible in terms of what I'm talking about, but there's other scriptures we're gonna read as well. So we're gonna go to Genesis and we're going to read <clears throat> Genesis 27. I'm gonna read several verses down there. We're gonna read Genesis 27, probably one through, well, we'll see, we'll see. So I'll just put Genesis 27 on the screen. Genesis 27, this is the story of Jacob, Esau. Uh, Jacob and Esau were twin brothers and their parents, Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac was the promised child of Abraham. Isaac was the son that Abraham had with his wife, Sarah. Abraham was a hundred years old when he fathered Isaac and Sarah was 90. So Isaac was that miracle baby. He wasn't just a late in life baby. He was actually a miracle baby because both of their bodies were dead sexually. There was no way on their own they could reproduce at those advanced ages. And God breathed life into Abraham and that's how they had Isaac. Isaac was a miracle baby. So Isaac grew up and got married a woman and married a woman named Rebecca. And Rebecca gave birth to twins. Those twins were Jacob and Esau. Esau came out first. And when Jacob came out, his hand was on Esau's heel. That's why they named him Jacob, because it means supplanter. Okay. He's trying to grab on his brother, trying to grab stuff from his brother. They came out the womb that way. I can't imagine what that did to Rebecca to have them boys fighting in her womb and coming out like that. But that's what happened. So we're going to read the story today of <clears throat> how Jacob tricked his father, Isaac, into getting Esau's elder brother blessing, the birthright. You heard me talk about that before. Okay, so we're in Genesis 27. We're going to start with verse one. I'm not quite sure how far down I'm going to read. Here we go. I'm reading out of the New Century Version. When Isaac was old, his eyesight was poor, so he could not see clearly. One day he called his older son Esau to him and said, son. Esau answered, here I am. Isaac said, I am old and I don't know when I might die. So take your bow and arrows and go hunting in the field for an animal for me to eat. When you prepare the tasty food that I love, bring it to me and I will eat. Then I will bless you before I die. So Esau went out in the field to hunt. Rebecca, that's the mama, was listening as Isaac said this to his son Esau. Uh, Isaac favored Esau and Rebekah favored Jacob. Esau was more of a hunting man, a huntsman, an outdoorsman, and Jacob was more of kind of a mama's boy, but he wasn't weak. He just wasn't an outdoor type. She said, excuse me, she said to her son Jacob, listen, I heard your father saying to your brother Esau, kill an animal and prepare some tasty food for me to eat. Then I will bless you in the presence of the Lord before I die. So obey me, my son, and do what I tell you. Go out to our goats and bring me two of the best young ones. I will prepare them just the way your father likes them. Then you will take the food to your father and he will bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to his mother, Rebecca, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm smooth. If my father touches me, he will know I am not Esau. Then he will not bless me, but will place a curse on me because I tried to trick him. So Rebecca said to him, if your father puts a curse on you, I will accept the blame. Just do what I said, go get the goats for me. So Jacob went out and got two goats and brought them to his mother and she cooked them in the special way Isaac enjoyed. She took the best clothes of her older son Esau that were in the house and put them on the younger son Jacob. She also took the skins of the goats and put them on Jacob's hands and neck. Then she gave Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. Jacob went into his father and said, father, and his father said, yes, my son, who are you? Because remember, Isaac, his eyesight is just about gone. Isaac cannot really see. Jacob said to him, I am Esau, your first son. I have done what you told me. Now sit up and eat some of the meat of the animal I hunted for you, then bless me. But Isaac asked his son, how did you find and kill the animal so quickly? Jacob answered, because the Lord your God helped me to find it. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son. Then I will know if you are really my son Esau. Okay, so then the story goes on and uh, Isaac touched him, touched his forearms to feel the fake hair that Rebecca had sewed on. And then he ate the food and then he blessed him. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to read the scripture. I want to show you this 
to show you that there is some high power trickery going on in the scripture. High power trickery, okay? Isaac was addressing Esau when he said, go get me the meat, go get me the venison because I'm about to die. Or I don't know when I'm gonna die and I wanna bless you before I do. Rebecca, the mama was listening and she's the one that came up with the scheme. The, the scheme that Jacob came up with was when Esau was out there hunting and Jacob said, sell me your birthright. And Esau sold Jacob his birthright for a bowl of stew. But Rebecca was the one that came up with the scheme to actually get Isaac to lay hands on the boy and actually bless him and give him that firstborn blessing. Rebecca was the one who said, I heard your father say all this stuff to Esau. So he's like, go get some goats and bring it to the young ones. I'll fix the meat like your father likes it. Then you're going to take him the food. And Jacob was like, but I'm smooth skinned. And Esau is hairy. So Rebecca was like, don't worry about that. She cut out the skin from the goats and took the hair from the goats and put them on Jacob's arms so he'd have hairy arms like uh, Esau. So when Isaac heard him, Isaac said, the voice is Jacob's, but the arms are Esau. So Isaac was like, okay, I guess you're Esau after he ate the meat. And Rebecca said, see, they both said some really dangerous stuff. Rebecca said, if your father puts a curse on you, I'll accept the blame. Lord have mercy, that's the wrong thing to say. Rebecca just said that she would take the blame. She would take the curse if Isaac ended up cursing that boy. Do you understand that's a generational curse that would, would never break off her? She's saying stuff like that. And then Isaac asked Jacob, how did you find and kill the animal so quickly? And Jacob said, because the Lord, helped, oh, he said, because the Lord helped me to find it. That ain't what happened. Your mama told you to go get them goats. So what am I trying to say here? Uh, because you need to know what happens after this. After this, Esau comes in after he actually did the hunt, after he actually went and got the meat. And then Isaac said, who are you? And Esau was like, I'm Esau. I went and got the food like you told me. And then Isaac started trembling. The Bible says he trembled greatly. He's like, oh, then who was that? It was in the tent before. And Esau was like, what are you talking about? And Isaac was like, I, I bless somebody. They, they said it was you. And it sounded like Jacob, but, but their arms are here like you. I thought it was you. So I gave him my blessing. And Esau started wailing. He started crying. He's like, well, well bless me. And Isaac is like, I can't take it back. That's why they was playing a dangerous game, because Isaac understood the power of the father's blessing and the father's curse. And Isaac was like, once I release that blessing, I, I can't take it back. I can't get it back. OK, and that's when Esau started crying when he realized what he had given up. <clears throat> but they played a dangerous game. Rebecca and Jacob did saying all that stuff. And Jacob used the name of the Lord. Talking about the Lord help me. Mm. So what's my point? That leads me to the point, my point, even though we're going to look at some other scriptures. That leads me to the point of today's prophetic word. Today's prophetic word is trickster. What the Holy Ghost wanted me to share is that some folks are trying to trick their way into the blessing of God. What happened to Jacob after this was that Esau got so mad, he said, I'm gonna kill him. He said, I'm gonna kill my brother. This, this boy done tricked me two times, tricked me on my birthright and tricked me on my blessing. Now those are two different things, the birthright and the blessing, but Jacob took both from Esau. Now Esau was trying to front like that was all Jacob's fault. Like he didn't sell him the birthright, but he did. But anyway, Esau got so mad, he said, I'm going to kill him. So Rebecca once again jumps in and tells Jacob to go to her brother, Laban, uh, Jacob's uncle. When he gets to Laban's house, he meets Rachel. He falls in love with Rachel so hard until he takes one look at her and he kisses her and he cries. He looks at Rachel, he kisses her, and Jacob started bawling. That, mm, see, that's some serious love right there. That means Rachel was so beautiful, or at least so beautiful in his eyes. He had to have her. So he agreed to work for seven years so he could marry Rachel. He worked in seven years and they got married. He found out the next day that it wasn't Rachel. It was her older sister, Leah. Laban tricked him. And then Jacob was like, what are you doing? And Laban was like, yeah, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> we got to marry the oldest girl first. <laughs> so he ended up working seven more years and a little bit more time after that. And then Laban kept changing his wages. He keeps saying, I'll pay you this many sheep. I'll pay you this many goats, whatever. Then he kept, you know, shuffling and changing all that. And so Jacob had to deal 
with anywhere from seven to 14, 20 more years of being tricked. He reaped just exactly what he sowed. Okay. And the Holy Ghost told me to say, right, birthright and blessing, two different things. Holy Ghost told me to say that some of y'all trying to trick your way into the blessings of God. Some of y'all think that they are shortcuts and you don't understand how you get things in the kingdom. And so you've been thinking that you could just do whatever you want to do and God's going to bless you anyway. That's, that's how the blessing is going to come. We're going to read some other scriptures. Okay. We're going to read Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 and 6. Now I'm going to read the King James uh, Version first because you're most familiar with that one. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let me read that some other translations. New International Version. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. New Living Translation. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Are you starting to get the picture? That's why you hear me say all the time, you have to study the word of God carefully. You got to study the word of God verse by verse, word by word. You got to go into the Hebrew and the Greek and you got to get a concordance, which you can get on Bible Hub. If you don't know where that is online, I will put it in the chat. Biblehub.com is where you can find your exhaustive concordance. You can look up every word in the scripture because you got to get behind the English. You've got to see the breadth of what the scripture is trying to say. The Bible told you that, first of all, you got to have real faith. You can't please God without faith. A lot of people don't know what faith is. A lot of people don't understand that faith is a substance. It's a spiritual substance, but it's a substance. Like love is a substance. Where does love live? In your heart. You can't go to Walmart and get a six pack of love. Where does hope live? Hope lives in your heart. You can't go to Target and get a 24 ounce bucket of hope. I need a price check on hope, aisle four. You can't get no hope that way. Hope is real. It's just not physical, it's spiritual. Well, faith is real. It's a spiritual substance and it's something that can increase. And the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So in other words, your Christian life is about increasing your faith, about believing God more and more as you walk with him. And then the scripture says, Hebrews eleven six: anyone that comes to him must believe that he exists. And that's why you see people in the world who keep saying they doubt the existence of God, don't get anything from the Lord because you can't step to God like that. You can't step to God questioning his existence. If you want to please God and you want to get blessed by God, you got to use the faith he gave you to believe that he is. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of atheists say that they don't believe in God. They don't believe there is a God and they don't believe in God. Uh-huh. I stopped by to tell you, I don't believe in atheists. There's no such thing as somebody don't believe in God. You know how I know that? Because you will when you need him. Yes, you will. Keep living. You talking all that yang about ain't no God and I got this and I'm in control and I make my own destiny and all that. Uh-huh. That's just right here. You talking. Just keep living. Because the day going to come. See, a lot of people have a high threshold tolerance for pain. So you think that because you can take a lot of pain, you can take everything life can dish out at you. What's going to happen if your child gets in trouble? Because you ain't felt no pain until your child gets in trouble. You ain't felt no pain until your child gets in trouble. And if your child gets in enough pain and you've got to watch that boy or that girl lay there and die, I'll bet you call on Jesus then. So away with this pe these people talking about they don't believe in God. Ain't no such thing as somebody don't believe in God. Okay? Because you will when you need him. You will when you need him. You will when you, you'll be on the ground talking about Jesus, please help me. Haven't you ever noticed that when people get in trouble, they run the church, they want, run the pastors, they run a prayer. Why is that if you don't believe in God? Ain't no such thing as somebody don't believe in God. You just ain't in enough pain yet. So the Bible said you got to believe that he is. And But here's the second part. That's why you have to read the whole Bible. That he rewards those who earnestly seek him, that diligently seek him, that sincerely seek him. Okay. What does that mean? It means just what it says. 
To seek God with diligence means that you are faithful and you have an ear towards detail. That means you talk to the Lord every day. You have quiet time every day. It means you're studying the scripture, you're in the word every day. You're listening to a sermon or a prophecy or something every day. To seek him earnestly and sincerely means that you mean it from here. You're not going through the motions. That you're not coming before the Lord out of show. So that's why a lot of people, we used to call them CMEs. We don't really go to church like we used to because of COVID. Some of that is coming back. But we used to call people CMEs. That's Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. They come to church three times a year. They come to church many times. And on Easter, you know, they got on their Easter best. And many times they come to church and they show up. They shout louder than anybody in the house. Come to church three times a year. And sometimes they feel magnanimous and they give God five whole dollars in the offering. And sometimes they feeling really magnanimous. They give God a 10 spot. They drop that $10 and then people think they're going to get the same blessing as people that serve God on the faithful, that serve God on the diligent because they're tricksters. They're trying to trick their way into the blessing of God. Why is the Holy Ghost telling me to say that? I'm going to get there. You got to stay with me. If you came on the broadcast late, you got to rewatch this from the beginning because you got to get everything I'm saying to get the full impact of this message. So stay with me till I get through. And if you came in late, watch from the beginning so you get the entire thought. The Bible told you that God rewards people that seek him on the regular, that seek him from a sincere place that seek him with an ear towards detail, okay? I'm gonna tell you in a minute how that in this time is what's gonna save your life. So you can't trick your way. <laughs> you can't trick your way into the blessings of God. Now, let me use my favorite example. I'm about to use my favorite example. I will actually use two. What are two of the things we care about the most? sex and money. So what we do is we go pick someone and maybe we start sleeping with them and then you start to bond with them and then you get attached to them and then you run into the presence of God and you literally ask God to approve the relationship because you picked them. I'm not going to break up with them. I'm not going to sleep, stop sleeping with them. I've already decided I'm going to marry them. So God, I just want you to bless it. You never once ask the Lord, is this the right one? You never once said, okay, well, I'm not going to live in fornication because I'm not going to start bonding myself because sex is designed to take two and make them one. So you never said, I'm not going to bind myself to this person. You just jumped on in a relationship and then you ask God to bless it later. And now you're in a marriage and you're struggling because maybe it doesn't even occur to you that maybe that wasn't even the right person. You know why? Because you never asked God. You did what you wanted to do and then retroactively asked God to bless it. And that's not... <laughs> That's not how it works. If you want to get God's blessing, you've heard me say it a million times. How do you get blessed from the Lord? You have to HBO. You have to hear, you have to believe, and you have to obey. You have to hear what the Lord is saying. You have to believe that he loves you, believe that what he's saying is true, and believe that what he's saying is in your best interest. And then if you believe all that, then you will owe oh, you'll obey. That's how you get God's blessing. You don't go do something your way and then bring God the leftovers and then demand that he bless it. That's what a lot of people do. That's why a lot of people are married to the wrong person. That's why a lot of people say they can't find a relationship. And that's why a lot of people are in a marriage that's making them miserable. Because all that, you did that. You did not bother to ask the Lord, number one, do you want me to get married? Number two, when? If that answer is yes, when? At what point in my life do you want me to get married? And number three, to who? You never prayed that prayer. You went and picked somebody. And that's the reason you're struggling now. Or maybe you never got married or maybe you've been married seven times. You know why you keep failing in that area? Because you're trying to do it your way. You never ask the Lord, what is your will? That's what it means to earnestly seek God, that I'm not coming to God trying to make him approve my program. That's what a lot of Christians try to do. That ain't going to never work. God is not a genie. He's not your personal genie. He's not some type of divine slave for you. He don't bow down before us. We bow down before him. He don't follow us. We follow him. And if that's not your mindset, if you're not earnest about that, if you keep thinking that you can just do what you want and then ask the Lord to rubber stamp it like he was some genie coming out the lamp, you're mistaken. 
Hold on, let me take a quick swig of water. You're incorrect, and that's why you're in the trouble that you're in right now. Example number one. Example number two is money. Lord have mercy. If you ever heard somebody say, I gave this amount of money, and the week after, I had $14 million in my account. They're, they're missing a few details. <laughs> also, just because you hear about God doing something for somebody else don't mean that's what the Lord is saying to you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to bless you financially. But what it means is that he has a personal program for you, which is why he says you have to seek him. In other words, you have to ask him. You can't assume that you know what his will is for you. Because just because he did it that way for that person, he will bless you. But it don't mean he's going to do it that way for you. And so many people, when they hear other people's testimonies, they miss the point of the testimony. The point of the testimony is that God did it. But what we fall in love with is the way it happened. So then we say, well, Sister Johnson said that she just went to so-and-so and she found a husband. So then you think that means that if you go to where she went, you're going to find a husband. That, that's what worked for her. That's what the Lord told her to do. Like I have a relative where the Lord told her to move out of state. And I was like, are you sure? And she said, yeah, because the Lord told me my husband's there. She obeyed. She went. Met her husband. They're together now. Three beautiful children. Because that's what the Lord told her to do. That does not mean because the Lord did it that way for her, it's going to happen that way for you. But when you fall in love with a formula, that's the sure sign that you are not seeking God because you want to know God. You seek in his hand. You ain't seeking his face. You are the teenager that walks in the house that doesn't speak to you, doesn't say, hi, how you doing? Just sticks their hands out and say, give me the car keys. You're the child that doesn't call your mother and doesn't call your father and say, how you doing? How's your day going? Is there anything I can do for you? How's everything, you know, how are you feeling? You only call them when you want something. Mama, can you cook me this? You haven't talked to your mama in months. You didn't ask how you doing. Mama, you know that bread you make? You know, mama, can you cook me that? Mama, I want this for Thanksgiving. You haven't talked to mama all summer. You've been busy running around doing what you want to do. But then when you want something, then you call her. That's the same way some of God's children treat him. But that's not how the promise works. God is equal to his word. That's why you got to study the word. And the Lord said he rewards people that seek him because they want to know him. Seek him earnestly. Seeking his will. Seeking his face. God, what do you want me to do? Not my will, but thine be done. And if you don't ever bless me again, that's fine. Because you've already blessed me more than I deserve. It's you that I love, Lord. It's you that I love. See, as opposed to just running in the house and sticking your hand out, talking about gimme. And that's what we that's what we want. We want them formulas. We want them formulas to where you put $10 in the offering plate and God put a million dollars in your bank account. Now he can, and for some people he does do it that way. But if God is going to bless you financially, you have to ask him, what way are you taking me to my financial blessing? And that requires seeking him. That requires asking him. What if the Lord don't tell you everything in one session? What if the Lord outlays the plan to you in a series of sessions? So what if you pray every day and God gives you a small piece every day? What if there's seven parts of the plan and Sunday through Saturday, God gives you a different part every day? That means if you didn't pray on Friday, you missed part six. Do you understand? That's what I'm trying to tell you. The Bible said you have to earnestly seek him, not his hand. He's not a genie. So that's why this prophetic word is about people that are trying to trick their way. They're trying to trick their way into the blessings of God. And they keep wondering, why ain't this working? This ain't working because you're not earnest and you're not seeking him. You're trying to do like Jacob. You're trying to get over. You can't get over on God and you can't get over on God's people. It's going to catch up with you. You're going to reap just exactly what you sow. I'm going to move on to another scripture and give you another example of what I'm talking about. Uh, we're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 8. And we're going to read <clears throat> 9 through 22. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 9 through 22. Now, I'm putting that in the chat. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 
<clears throat> 22. Here it is, and I am reading out of King James Version. Book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Now, let me stop here and say the word sorcery in Greek, that word is pharmakos. Pharmakos is the same word we get pharmaceutical from. So when you see sorcery in the Bible, it might be talking about spells and incantations, but sometimes it's talking about drugs because drugs take you out of your mind. Drugs bewitch you. Drugs turn you into somebody that you're not. You see what I mean? So it's not always talking about a spell or an incantation, which is witchcraft. Sometimes it's talking about pharmaceuticals, it's talking about drugs. So sometimes sorcerers in the Bible would give people potions that would make them high. See, so drug dealing is not new, if you didn't know that. But there's a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself for some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying, this man is the great power of God, uh, running a scam. And to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He wouldn't have been wondering if he was right because God would have done miracles to him. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, Peter and John, and they received the Holy Ghost. Peter and John laid their hands on the new believers and the new believers received the Holy Ghost. And went, verse 18, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart, thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Let's review. This man, Simon, was running a scam. <laughs> he was running a scam, okay? He was running a, a religious scam that he had set up with some type of sorcery, okay? Some type of uh, incantation or... Uh, sometimes, okay, now this particular word is Magion. This one says sorcery or magic. So this one was incantations. But sometimes when you see that word sorcery in the Bible, it's pharmacos. So you got to look it up in the Greek. So he had tricked these people. He had done some razzle dazzle and made them people believe that he was the voice of God. Does that tell you anything about scam artists? Does that tell you that the devil will come to you many times in religious trappings? <laughs> to make you think it's the Lord. That's why you have to know the Lord for yourself. That's why you have to know the scriptures for yourself, okay? And then he's running this scam and he set himself up to be the great power of God. And they had regard because that of a long time, he had bewitched them with sorceries for a long time. He had bewitched them for a long time. That means this man had been running his scam for a long time and he had been doing a razzle dazzle, okay? And the people bought it. So then he ended up becoming a believer, but he was still thinking carnally. So he started following Philip. And then he saw the signs and, and miracles that Philip, that was coming to Philip. And he wondered, that's how you know he won real. Because you don't have to wonder about signs and miracles when you know the Lord, when you know the Holy Ghost. Because you know that God is not a respecter of person. The, the power comes from the Holy Ghost. You're just the vessel. God tells you to HBO, hear, believe, and obey. That's your part. The power is from the Holy Ghost. The power is in the word of God, not you. Okay? If you know God, you know that. So the apostles come down, and Peter and John come down, and they put hands on these new believers, and the Holy Ghost fell on them, and Simon saw that. 
And he said, how much for the Holy Ghost? He said, I'll give you some cash. Give me that power. Peter said, your money can go. And <laughs> I just started to say, bust hell wide open. Peter said, your money can go and perish with you because you thought the Holy Ghost could be bought with money. And then Peter said this right here, you don't have part nor lot in this matter because your heart ain't right. What did Peter just say? And no, I didn't cuss because hell is a place. So saying bust hell wide open is not swearing. So calm down. <laughs> so because Jesus said you make uh, your disciples twofold the child of hell out the Lord's mouth. So no, that's not cussing. So calm down. So <laughs> Peter said, you don't have part. No, you don't have a lot in this matter because your heart ain't right. He said, your heart ain't right. He said, your heart ain't right. How did Peter know his heart wasn't right? Because he offered money for the Holy Ghost. That don't tell you anything. The Holy Ghost is freely given. The Spirit of God is here to freely fall upon us. Freely fall upon us, okay? And he's like, let me buy that power because I want to lay my hands on people and give them the Holy Ghost too. And Peter said, your heart ain't right. Why? Why did Peter say that to Simon? And Peter said, repent of this wickedness and pray God that maybe the thought of your heart could be forgiven you. And then Peter said, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. What did Peter just do? Peter walked in discerning of spirits. Peter noticed that in that man's spirit was a root of bitterness, the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. In other words, Simon was jealous he was mad that these people came and started upstaging him. And he had been carrying bitterness in his heart. And Peter said he was in the bond of iniquity. That means he was bound by unclean spirits, which is what happens when you give yourself to demons. When you work in sorcery and magic, then demons got a hold of you. That's why they're teaching you to put other people in bondage because you're in bondage. So Peter was able to discern all of that. Okay. And why am I pointing this out? because Simon wasn't right. He tried to get the power of God. He tried to get the blessing of God. He tried to buy it. And Peter said, you don't have nothing to do with this because your heart ain't right. He said, you don't have nothing to do with this because your heart ain't right. You don't have anything. You don't have nothing to do with this because your heart ain't right. Are you listening? Okay, a few more scriptures and I'll be done. And I will tell you why the Holy Ghost told me to say this. OK, we're going to bring it all together for you. Let's go over to John chapter 10. OK, let's go over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 It's familiar scriptures, but I want to point some things out to you. John chapter 10, I'm reading out a new international version. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Drop down to verse seven, John chapter 10, verse seven. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Now that's two times the Lord said thieves and robbers. What's the difference between a thief and a robber? <clears throat> a robber gets in your face with a gun or a knife and says, give me your goods. A thief waits till you're out the house and breaks through the window and takes your stuff. So the Lord said that there are people who are trying to get in the kingdom and trying to do what they do. They're either getting in your face, taking your goods, or they wait until you're gone and breaking in your house. The Lord said, that's not me. The Lord said, that's a thief and a robber. The Lord said, I'm the, the way. I'm the entrance into the, 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 the sheep pen. The Lord says, I'm the way. So in other words, the Lord says, you don't get anything in and out of my kingdom by doing a runaround behind me. Okay? You don't get anything. The Lord said, if you're trying to get anything out of the kingdom of God, any other way than the name of Jesus, you are a thief and a robber. OK, and we just learned how some people like Simon are trying to run a scam in Jesus name. That's why you have to know the Lord for yourself. OK, <clears throat> now I'm going to tell you the point of all this. 
Because you said, Prophet Taylor, this has been some strong teaching and there's been some strong words by you. What is the point? Here it is. Don't miss it. The point is, is that you have entered into, well, there's two points. The first point, uh, I'll start with the second point first. Second point is that you cannot get saved on Friday and pastor a 30,000 member church on Monday. <laughs> You cannot just got, you just got born again on Friday night, Friday night, you know, service that you were watching the video online and the Holy Spirit convicting your heart. You got born again. And then now you ready to have this big TV ministry and all that. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, the Lord took 30 years to get ready for a three and a half year ministry. That's Luke 252. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So we see Jesus at 12 years old. He knew who he was. And he was in the temple talking about matters of the law with the grown men. And they were astonished that this 12 year old boy understood the law the way he did. Mary and Joseph had left. They left Jesus. They came back. And Mary is like, what are you doing? Why, why didn't you come with us? And that's when the Lord said his famous words, I have to be about my father's business. Nevertheless, he submitted to Mary and Joseph. And then the Bible says he grew. That's from 12 to 30. That's 18 more years of training. If when God became a man, he gave himself 30 years to grow for a three and a half year ministry. Why do we think that we're ready for a 30 year ministry in three days? So many of us have jumped to some places too soon. So many of us have asked God for a weight that you're not ready to handle yet because you're not, you didn't give yourself time to grow. That's the thief and the robber way. That's the shortcut way. That's the shortcut way. And don't listen to people that 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 ain't in the word because the Lord said, I will reward those that diligently seek me, those that earnestly seek me. In other words, you have to be sincere in your relationship with God, but you got to show up every day. You got to show up every day. Uh, what the Bible does, the Bible tends to give us highlights. But many times when you read between the lines of the scriptures, you can see sometimes the Bible is skipping years. So sometimes the Bible will say, and it came to pass, and so what happened, blah, blah, blah. And it's 20 years between that last verse and this verse. Okay, so that's why you have to study that out for yourself. But the point I'm trying to make there is that a whole bunch of people think that you're just going to pop your fingers. See, that's a genie concept. And you've been in the word two days. And you, <laughs> and you think that's going to give you the same result as if you've been in the word 20 years. You're trying to shortcut. You're trying to shortcut. You are asking God for stuff that you are not ready for. I will go to my favorite example, my two favorite examples, money and marriage. Okay. If you ask God for a lot of money, I stop by to tell you that if you don't change the way you think, a lot of money is not going to solve your problem. And your money is always going to come down to how you think. So if you are used to living on a $30,000 level, and let's say you got a windfall, and you got like $30 million. It will take less than six months for that 30 million to come down to 30,000. You'll be in more debt than you were before. You know why? Because you didn't grow financially up here. You didn't put in the time to study money and get yourself a financial advisor and study the cycles of money and study how money works and study the markets that you didn't do any of that. You didn't grow financially. And if you don't grow financially, if God gave you $30 million, that $30 million is going to come down to how you think unless you and until you learn how to come up to manage money on that level. So a lot of people that you're trying to shortcut, you think hitting the lottery is going to solve your problems. Have you ever studied lottery winners? There's maybe one out of 50 that their lives get better. And most of the people whose lives get better from playing the lottery don't actually change the level they were living at before they got the money. Just about everybody that wins the lottery ends up way worse. And a lot of people end up dead. You know why? Because <laughs> you're not ready to handle 30 million if you can't manage 30,000. Because the scriptural principle is faithful and little, faithful and much. But you're asking God for all this money because you think that's going to solve your problem. And God is trying to tell you, I need you to grow financially. I need you to learn how the markets work. I need you to understand timing and seasons. I need you to understand investing because investing is no different from planting a garden in your backyard. You got to work the ground, you got to plant a seed, you got to wait. 
You got to water it. You got to let it spring up. You got to put some fertilizer on it. You got to uh, put some bug spray, something to, to kill the bugs. You have to do a lot. Then you get a harvest. Money works just like that. But if you're trying to, trying to shortcut the time, that's why it's not working. Because God will always ask you, what are you doing with the money I already gave you before he gives you more? One, marriage. Marriage is another one. Anybody that I personally know and anybody that I've studied that has a successful long-term relationship, they will all tell you the same thing. They built that relationship over years. Everybody gets the infatuation that starts at the beginning. Infatuation eventually wears off. And if you get married in the summer of love, summer are gonna give way to fall, and fall are gonna give way to winter, and winter are gonna give way to spring. How often does that happen? Every year. And most people break up in a winter season because it's, it's dry, it's cold, there are no leaves and you don't know how to make it through a winter season. Because if all you have was infatuation, you didn't even see winter coming. But people that successfully build a long-term marriage learn how to navigate each season because they come every year, okay? And if you've been together a long time and you got a good relationship, you paid your dues for that relationship. How many times have you seen people not want someone until you get with them and then you've been with them for a while and y'all got a good thing going. And now here come this person want to come in and take your relationship. You ever seen that? You've been investing in your wife for 20 years and your wife is a good wife. Now here come this man trying to take her from you after all the investment you put in her. You've been investing in your husband and your husband is a good man. Okay. And here come this side chick trying to take that man from, see, them people is thieves and robbers. And what the Holy Ghost wanted me to say to the saints is, don't you be like that. If God gave himself 30 years for a three and a half year ministry, 30 years for a three and a half year ministry, then maybe you need to give it some time and stop trying to take the shortcut and realize that maybe I need to pay my dues and go step by step. I need to build that money up. I need to build that ministry up. I need to build that marriage up. I need to build that child up because raising a child is a minimum of 16 years, tops out maybe at around 22, 25 years if you get them through college or you get them into a marriage. That's 16 to a quarter century and about half a million dollars per child. And once your child gets married, your job's not over because you're going to be a grandparent or you might already be a grandparent, but there's things you do at a different stage of life because your parenting doesn't even end after you die. My father's still in my head now. Oh, yes, my prophetic, my father's prophetic words and my father's wisdom still in my head right now. Your parenting goes on after you die. Parenting is forever. I remember when the Lord taught me that parenting is not till they're 18. Parenting is not till they get married. Parenting is forever. Because some of that stuff my father told me back when I'm 13, 14, 15 years old is still ringing true in my head right now. And I remember some stuff I told, uh, I looked at my dad and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And my father said, that's okay. He said, don't worry about it. Just, just hear what I'm saying. And when it's time for you to understand, he said, the Holy Ghost will bring it back to you. That's the truth. Some of that stuff dad deposited in me, it was many years later. And then I got it because the spirit of God said, this is what your father's talking about. I was like, oh. So what's my point? My point is, <clears throat> uh, one time I was at this church and I was leading a meeting and it was a parent meeting. My son came in from the back door. He came in and he walked around. He grabbed me from the bottom and he hugged me and I hugged him back. And we embraced for a few seconds. And then he walked back out. He just wanted to come in and give me a hug. And all the parents started smiling. He's like, how do you get your kid to do that? I said, get him to do what? They said, hug you in public. I said, we hug like that all the time. See, it wasn't, it wasn't a new thing. It wasn't a show that, you know, we hug like that at home. That, that was a normal part of our relationship. And that's my point that you trying to jumpstart a relationship with a child, but you haven't put the years in. You got to put the years in. And if you don't put the years in, then you got to take it from where you start. It takes time. It takes time to build money. It takes time to build faith. It takes time to build a ministry. It takes time to build a marriage. It takes time to raise a child. It takes time to raise a grandchild. It takes time. And the Holy Ghost wanted me to say to the saints, don't be like the thieves in the rock. Don't be like Simon, that then you can buy the Holy Ghost. Don't be like Jacob trying to trick your way into stuff. Don't be trying to shortcut because the Lord gave himself 30 years. Okay.
uh, uh, and let me uh, give you this last one. Do you know how old Daniel was when he went to Lions Den? Scholars disagree. Daniel was somewhere between 70 and 80 years old. 70 and 80, you heard me. <laughs> Daniel was somewhere between 70 and 80 years old when he went into the lion's den. That's a lifetime worth of faith because I believe Daniel had the gift of faith because Daniel believed God is an eight-year-old boy. When Daniel said, I'm not going to eat the king's meat, he's very young. When he went to the lion's den, that man was somewhere between 70 and 80. Do you understand that's a lifetime worth of faith to stop the mouths of the lions? So in other words, Daniel built that faith up over the lifetime of his walk with God. Do you understand? Okay, that's reason number one. Here come reason number two. Reason number two is because you have entered into a season where the world around you has changed. You have entered into a season where there is death in the streets. You've heard me say this before. There's death in people's mouths. There's death in people's breath. People are literally breathing out COVID. They are literally breathing out death. Do you understand what kind of time and season you are in? And you are in a time where you are going to have to, like the Lord said in John 10, did my sheep know my voice? You're going to have to hear what God is saying to you. I told you I was going to tie it all together. You're going to have to hear what God is saying to you with small details, with diligence. You heard me say it last week. I'm going to say it again for those that were you that didn't hear last week's sermon. You should be at the point now where you are asking the Lord, should I go to the grocery store? Should I go today? Should I go now? So at the be beginning of your day, you said, God, well, he, uh, here are my plans. This is what I want to do today, but not my will, but thine be done. You guide me. If I ain't supposed to go shopping today, Lord, then don't let me go. Or, or if there's something else you want me to do, you have the freedom to interrupt me at any time and push me where you want me to go. If you're driving and the Holy Ghost say, don't go down that street, don't argue with him. If the Holy Ghost gives you a warning and said, don't go down that street, he might not say any more than that. If he says, don't go down in that street, then take a left. Because whatever it was that was down that street, God wanted you to miss it. If you ignore the voice of the Holy Ghost and you go down that street, then all that stuff going to come upon you, whatever was on that street that God wanted you to miss. Might have been a car accident, might have been a pothole, might have been gunshots, might have been a traffic jam that's going to take three hours out your day because it's going to take three hours for you to get out. And all the Holy Ghost said was, don't go down that street. If you had HBO, and if you heard him, believed him, obeyed him, you could avoid it, whatever that was. But see, that's the kind of time we're in now. That's what I'm trying to say. The Lord gave a prophetic word, and it's on my page a couple of weeks back about how he's looking for people that are, are, are listening to him. He's looking for people that are earnestly, diligently seeking him, which is right in line with the scriptures that we read, because you're in a time now where missteps can be fatal. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you're at a time where missteps can be fun? Why do you think there's so many people dying in the street? There are some days where you ain't supposed to leave the house. And if you had prayed in the morning before you started your day, the Lord, because sometimes the Lord doesn't speak it to you. Sometimes the Lord downloads it in your spirit. Sometimes God gives you a divine download because your spirit has a greater capacity than your mind and your mind is incredible. But in your spirit, sometimes you know things. It's not that God said it to you with an audible voice, but sometimes in your spirit, you just know stuff. You just say, well, I know I ain't supposed to go out today, or I know something's going on with a certain person. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, I, I got a prophetic word about someone weeks ago and then found out some things that were going on with them because the Lord tried to warn us weeks ago that this person was in danger. That's what I'm talking about. That's why I always say, I don't understand why people would reject the prophetic. Why would you not want an early alert warning from God? Why? I, that doesn't make any sense to me. So whatever it was you heard about the prophetic, whoever hurt your feelings, whatever you think it is, go with what the scripture says. Read the Bible for yourself. First Corinthians 14, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Okay, Prophes the prophetic belongs to you. It's not some elite thing. You've been listening to religious people, if that's what you think. It's not some elite thing that, well, that's only for them. No, it's for every believer because that's what the scripture says. That's why you hear me say all the time, you got to read the Bible for yourself. But you live in a time. What if God is telling you to start a business and you keep procrastinating? 
and you find out two years from now that industry blew up into billions and you could have rolled that wave. But God told you to start that business before anybody knew what was going on. Don't you know the Lord does that all the time? Don't you know the Lord tells you stuff before it manifests by sight? Because by the time people see it, they're going to run and try to get on and everything going to change once it becomes seen. God will tell you stuff. Don't you know, I'm going to use my favorite example again. Don't you know that's how a lot of women miss their husband? What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, that's how a lot of women have missed their husbands. The man that God had for you, you missed him. Do you know why you missed him? Because you were looking for Bishop Jakes because you were looking for Jeff Bezos. You were looking for uh, Warren Buffett. You were looking for Bill Gates. You were looking for this multi-billionaire with a developed business, with all this cash, with all this property. And you turned your nose up at some dude that was just making $30,000. And God was trying to tell you, that's your husband. And you were like, mm -mm, cause you just thought he wasn't good enough. What you don't understand is that God was trying to, God was gonna give that brother a business idea that in 10 years is going to blow him up to that multi-million dollar level. And he was trying to give you a chance to become his wife and give you a 10 year head start to build a foundation. Because once he gets rich, all the women go want him then. So that's why God was trying to give you 10 years to lay a foundation so that y'all could become tight. So that when God gave him the multi-million dollar idea and he blew up, he would have a tight relationship with you, his wife. But you were looking for a finished product. You were walking by sight and not by faith. You thought you could look at a man and decide, I'm going to marry him because he was already at a certain level. If he's already at a certain level, then all the girls want him in. God was trying to give you someone before all that happened so you could spend some time. And I know the same thing is true with your child. You don't know who's in the womb. You don't know who that child is. You better not reject that child. You better ask God, who is this that you gave me and invest in them? That child might grow up and save your life. That very child might grow up and save your life. That's going to be 20, 30 years down the road, maybe, but that very child. Because God tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. God tells us to HBO. God says, hear me, believe me, and obey me. So what if God has dropped something in your spirit and you keep looking around for evidence and ain't no sensory evidence? It's a business nobody ever thought of. It's a business nobody ever heard of before. Or maybe it's a ministry. If you minister the way people like for you to minister, then you can be a popular preacher and be on TV and have this big congregation. If you minister in ways that people don't like, they're going to say you're not safe. What do I mean by that? If you do like Jesus did and you talk to people that other people don't like, like people that are really sick, people that are deformed because lepers, lepers, it can get so bad until your body parts start falling off. Like big patches of skin can fall off. I've seen it. Your arms, your fingers can fall off. And the Lord talks to people like that or promiscuous people like the woman at the well who had five husbands and the man she had now wasn't hers or like the woman caught in adultery. If you minister to people like that, a lot of people are going to turn at their nose and be like, mm, I thought you were supposed to be saved. What if God is calling you to hurting people that other people don't want to be bothered with? I mean, the last time I talked about sometimes God calls you out of something and then sends you right back into that environment because you understand it. That's what he did with Moses. Why do you think the Lord let Moses grow up in Egypt? So Moses could understand Egypt because he had to go back and stick his finger in Pharaoh's face and said, I am that I am, said, let my people go. Moses understood that was the, the country he grew up in. So sometimes God is going to put something in you that nobody's ever seen. Like you write a book that just sound crazy. It just sound, well, the reason it's crazy is because it's not out here yet. What if God had told you about the internet in the eighties? Do you know who had a chance to own the internet? IBM. IBM had a chance to patent the internet and they passed on it. They have to kick themselves about that every day. I'm sure they do. Because what if IBM owned the internet? That means you have to pay them every time you got online. Think about it. They had a chance to patent the internet and they said, no, nah, this ain't nothing. Okay. <laughs> so God might have dropped something in your spirit and everybody around you, you know, they're going to say that you're crazy, but you know, the Holy Ghost told you do this thing right here. That thing might not come into vogue. What if, what if uh, somebody had explained YouTube to you in the early 90s? 
or, or, or you know, anything that's normal now. What if somebody had, had explained social media to you back in the early 90s? Anything that's a normal part of our lives now, what if someone had explained it to you before it became popular? Everybody would have laughed and said you were just insane, right? Because that's always the people, the way people respond to the prophetic. Because people tend to walk by sight. They say, well, if I don't see it and it don't make sense to me, it can't be real. What if the Lord is trying to tell you before, before God is trying to get you in on the ground floor, you can't get no more ground floor than God. One more time. You can't get any more ground floor than the Lord. And what if he's trying to drop something in your spirit and telling you to write a book that nobody's ever written and you know they're going to say you're crazy. But he told you to do it anyway. Are you going to HBO? Are you going to hear God? Are you going to believe him? Are you going to obey him? Because there might be millions of dollars at stake that you don't get a chance to harvest because you didn't obey when the Lord told you to. Because you didn't obey when the Lord told you to. That's why the scripture says, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. So you are living in a time where if you don't do what the Lord is telling you to do when he tells you to do it, the way he tells you to do it. A few years down the road, you're going to look back and say, you're going to see somebody out there with a book like what the Holy Ghost gave you talking about. Now, I thought I heard the Holy Ghost tell me that, but see, they read that blessing now. That's why I told you the story of Jacob and Esau, because don't ever think somebody else can't take your kingdom. Don't ever think that somebody else can't take your blessing because they can. A whole lot of people have lost their marriages because they thought that, that couldn't nobody ever take your wife from you. That's not true. Can nobody ever take your husband from you? That's not true. You stopped investing. You took them for granted. You can't treat your marriage like that. You can't treat your children like that. You can't treat your money like that. You can't treat your ministry like that. God's ministry plan is you minister till you die. You can't find nobody in the Bible that retired. Please find me that. <laughs> Please find me that anywhere in scripture. Anybody got called in the Bible, they minister till they die. Ain't no retirement. There's different stages, different stages of life. God got something for you to do every day you draw breath. That's why you have to be before him every day asking him, what's your will today? You understand? Because you are in a season of life and death that a misstep can take you out, okay? And you are in a season where God is planting now for blessings in the future and it's not gonna look like anything you've seen before and you're gonna have to go on pure faith. The Holy Ghost told me to write this book. Ain't nobody else writing books like this. I know I'm gonna look crazy, but I'm gonna obey. 10 years from now, everybody's gonna be writing books like that and you were first. And if you don't do it, when God tells you to do it, you're going to miss that because ain't nothing like being first to the market. Okay. All right. Well, that's our time. I could go on and say some more, but I want to be sure I got out everything that the Holy Ghost gave me to get out. Stop trying to trick your way (laughs) into the blessings of God. The way into the blessings of God is HBO, hear, believe, and obey. The way into the blessings of God is diligently seeking. That means seek him every day, get in the word every day, get in prayer every day. Come before him every day. Ask him every day. The Lord, you may spend 30 days and the Lord might not say nothing. Then on that 31st day, he gives you a plan that changes your life. He rewarded you because you sought him for a month and you hung in there even though he wasn't saying nothing. As opposed to them seeing me who only talk to God three times a year and think they're going to reap the same harvest as people that talk to God every day. If you have five children, you have one child that does whatever you say. It says, yes, mama. You say, I need so and so and so. And that one child said, yes, mama. Yes, ma'am. Yes, father. Yes, sir. And then you got that one child ain't thinking about you, ain't studying you, and they don't understand that when you get ready to leave this world, whatever it is that you have accumulated, you're going to trust it to the child that obeyed. You're going to trust it to the child that didn't talk back and be disrespectful. And they're not going to get that. And they're not going to understand. They're going to do just like Esau. They cut themselves out the wheel because of their disrespect. And they're not going to get it. Mm. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen that happen. Okay? It's no different with God. It's no different. All right. So that's our time. Uh, Thank you so much to those of you that watched me live. 
Thank you to so much of you that are those of you that are watching on the replay. And when I get this up on YouTube, uh, praise God. You know, you hear me say it all the time. I'm uh, humbled and honored to be a vessel for the Holy Ghost. And I am uh, glad to be used of God because God does not need me. God don't need me. What do he need me for? He's given me an opportunity, opportunity to put his word. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful. So remember I told you in every video, I'm going to ask you to do one thing because my goal this year is to increase my reach. So this year, uh, this year, this day on this video, what, you, what I want you to do is the same thing I asked you last time. I want you to share this video, share it in as many places as you can. Okay. Because if the Lord is giving us words and telling us not trying to, to trick our way into uh, his blessings, then the saints need to hear that. So I want you to share this video as many places as you can. There's a lot of prophetic pages on Facebook sharing as many places as you can. And they tell you to take it down. Don't worry about it. Just share it in the places that you can share it. So other people have a chance to hear this word. Okay. That's been one of the mistakes that the church has made, ignoring the apostolic and the prophetic, because no one gift has it all. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, and teacher. There's no one office that has it all. Why would God make five if it was just one? You see that? So people that don't walk in the prophetic, or maybe they don't go in a prophetic church, then they need to hear the prophetic word of God. Okay. All right. Amen. God bless. Uh, man, it's April 18th already. 2021 is on the move. So I will be here at the same time next week, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my next weekly live prophetic word. If you want to bless me financially, I put my Zelle in the uh, chat because uh, some people have asked me um, how to bless me financially. So my Zelle's in the chat. So praise God. Thank you so much. I will see you next week. And remember, we're not going to trick our way in the blessings of God. We're going to take time. We're going to do our due diligence. We're going to seek the Lord earnestly. We're going to seek him every day. And we're going to learn how to HBO. We're going to learn how to hear him, believe him, and obey him. And that's how we get into his perfect will and his full blessing. Amen and God bless.